In 1889, a series of poisoned boxes of candy were mailed to prominent religious leaders in Atlantic Canada's industrial port city of St. John. The mysterious case echoed an almost identical series of candy poisonings a few months earlier near Toronto. In both events, similar sets of dainty little white boxes containing candy laced with strychnine poison were sent to church ministers. There was a killer on the loose in Canada using poisoned candy to murder people. You're listening to Backyard History. The hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes. With your host and author, Andrew McLean. In 1889, St. John was a rugged and industrial port city that was home to some 45,000 people. As New Brunswick's largest city, it was home to the province's wealthy elites who lived in enormous mansions and also home to slums filled with oppressive, crushing poverty. Its busy docks were home to a never-ending parade of shady characters, including transient sailors drifting in and out of town and local drunks with a reputation for violence. In spring of 1889, a 35-year-old pharmacist and department store owner named George A. Barker decided to run for mayor of St. John. He wasn't considered especially political before his run, but he was annoyed that the incumbent mayor was running for an unprecedented third term. Barker ran for mayor on a platform calling for new blood in City Hall, and he handily won that election. On June 19th, He was sworn in at a large and well-attended inauguration ceremony. Soon after, he began to feel ill. Over the next few days, he continued to get sicker and sicker. Doctors were perplexed with what was wrong with him. On July 6th, only three weeks after he was sworn in, Mayor Barker suddenly died. The cause of death was, rather bizarrely, declared to be worries over the election, and an autopsy was not performed. Four months later, on October 3rd, the postman delivered a small white box, three or four inches square, to Reverend McRae's house in St. John. The servant took the box inside and gave it to the Reverend's wife who opened it, discovering a dainty little box of candies. Soon after, Dr. James Christie was rushing towards the McRae house with the servant. At the later trial, he said, On the 2nd of October, I was called on to attend to Mrs. McRae at 10 a.m. or a couple of minutes before. I found her in the kitchen sitting in a chair near the end of the table. She was exceedingly pale, bathed in perspiration, and wore an anxious expression. She said, Oh, doctor, what can this mean? I can't keep still. Her arms then contracted and her body spasmed briefly. She said to the servant, Oh... Just get me a pillow and let me lie on the floor. She then had another spasm. Dr. James Christie would later recount in an interview with the Daily Telegraph newspaper. Soon after, Mrs. McRae went into a general technic convulsion which continued until her death, which occurred not three minutes after my arrival. The spasms first affected the fingers, then the limbs. Then her whole body became perfectly rigid. She could only have had strychnine poisoning. Dr. Christie was alarmed. He'd immediately recognized all the symptoms of strychnine poisoning. He scurried off to confer with another medical colleague, Dr. McLaren. Coincidentally, the deceased woman's son was in Dr. McLaren's office with the box of candy when he got there. When his mother fell ill, he immediately ran off to fetch a doctor, but had been much slower in finding one than her servant. The son only learned then that his mother was dead. The two doctors and the son rushed down Germain Street to the home of a chemist they knew named W.F. Best. The chemist was able to rig up a rough test and soon confirmed everyone's worst fears that the candy had been poisoned with strychnine. This chemist, W.F. Best, 
later described the events at the subsequent trial. Dr. Murray brought me a small white pasteboard box, three inches square and one inch deep. It was a brand name box. I made an analysis of the crystals found inside of the candies. They were strychnine. They were on the outside of some candies and on the interior of other candies. The perforations were through the paper covering the caramel. There was no strychnine in the bottom of the box, meaning either the candy or the crystals were dampened sufficiently to ensure adherence. Each candy contained at least a half a grain of American crystal strychnine. The deceased, Catherine McRae, was a Newfoundlander who had only relatively recently moved to the Maritimes. Her husband had spent 12 years as a minister in St. Andrew's Church in St. John's, Newfoundland, before they moved to St. John, New Brunswick. According to the Harbor Grace Standard newspaper, Catherine McRae was the daughter of a prominent and wealthy businessman in St. John's, named John McClay, and she had been quite accomplished in her own rights in the city, and... That news of her murder had produced a fearful shock in a community, and had awakened a profound feeling of sorrow in many households in St. John's. Meanwhile, back in St. John, on that same morning, the postman was oblivious to everything that had happened, and he was continuing his rounds, delivering the mail. He was only a couple blocks away from the McRae house when he arrived at the house of Rev. John De Sears on Union Street. The postman saw the Reverend on a step, and he handed him his mail. It was a little white box. The Daily Telegraph newspaper reported that the Reverend was somewhat surprised at receiving such a thing in the mail. The little white box didn't look remotely suspicious to him. It was a high-quality box, manufactured by a well-known high-end candy manufacturer from Scotland. The somewhat perplexed Reverend opened the little white box's cover and found inside a mixed assortment of candies. However, when the Reverend glanced through the selection of different candies, he decided that he didn't care for any of those particular flavors. He set the little white box aside on a shelf inside of the house. He decided that he would give the candies to his stepdaughter when she got home. Soon after, though, the Reverend went back to the box. He had something of a sweet tooth, and after giving it some thought, he decided that he did, in fact, want some candy after all. He picked up a caramel from the mysterious white box and bit into it. Immediately, he detected a strange bitter taste to the candy, and he spat it out. He was annoyed. He later told a newspaper reporter that he thought the strange-tasting candy was the work of some practical joker, or perhaps it had been sent by a parishioner who didn't care for his last sermon. He figured someone had added a bitter aloe to the candy, as a rude joke. Irritated, Reverend John De Sears took the little white box across the street to Dr. Harding's house to complain to his neighbor about the mean trick someone had just played on him. There, he found the two other doctors conferring animatedly with his neighbor. They immediately identified the little white box he had in his hand, and his meticulously machine-like handwriting on the address being the same as the one who had just killed Catherine McRae moments earlier. The horror began to dawn on the doctors that the murder by poisoning of Catherine McRae wasn't an isolated incident, but rather there was a conspiracy afoot to murder Protestant clergymen in St. John. Meanwhile, only a few blocks away on Exmouth Street, Reverend Dinestadt's wife, Catherine, and her young granddaughter were checking their freshly delivered mail. They found it contained a mysterious small white box. Catherine Dinestadt opened the box to find what she described as A tempting display of confectionery, caramels, chocolate creams, all the choice candy. Why, I said, someone has been married. The child's attention was at once attracted by the sweets and, as granddaughters will do, she immediately demanded a share. Catherine Dinesett handed her grandchild a candy, but later recounted to the St. John Telegraph newspaper 
I had an undefined feeling that something was wrong. She snatched back the candy from her granddaughter, put it back in the box, snapped closed the lid, and set it down upon a high shelf. Meanwhile, in a different part of St. John, William Thompson, the principal of Lanchester Street School, had shown up early for work that morning, before the children began to arrive for class. He found 12 pieces of candy littered around the playground. He thought the candy looked like it was still good, but he preferred his students didn't eat food they found on the ground. He searched the schoolyard and he picked up the candy before taking it inside the school and throwing it away. As he searched the school grounds for candy, he noticed that even more pieces of candy had been placed in locations where the children would surely find it, on windowsills and outside of the school by its front doors. Meanwhile, across the city, word of the candy poisonings was spreading quickly, and the citizens of St. John began to panic. The Daily Telegraph commented that evening, Rumors concerning the case were thicker than the flies in midsummer and grew and spread more quickly than a western town does on the map. Catherine Dinestadt, who had received the box of poison candies, but had chosen not to give them to her granddaughter because she had a bad feeling about them, would only hear about the poisonings going on all around her city hours later. She also learned that the rumors of the poisoning were spreading hysterically, exaggerating the number of people who had been murdered. She later remarked to a reporter from the Telegraph, I only learned of the poisonings when my granddaughter came up to me and said, Oh, Grandma, two reporters are here to get the particulars of my death. The news swept through St. John, with people staying up late that night talking to strangers in the street about the news that someone was targeting the religious leaders of the city. Some Protestant ministers began fleeing St. John, while parishioners began arranging guards around the homes of others. The Daily Telegraph newspaper wrote, A dark plot has been revealed. To some of the various letterboxes in the city, the perpetrator approached and dropped in the little boxes themselves. The rest is mystery, and the next act in the drama will be awaited with the most interest. At a late hour last evening, the case was being discussed all over the city, and all agreed that the enormity of the mysterious crime was almost inconceivable. What is the object? Who is the author of this plot which evidently aims at carefully selected individuals? Why is the attempt directed especially at the clergy? The rest is mystery, and the next act in the drama will be awaited with the most intense interest. The St. John police immediately began an investigation. The police weren't some small-town naive cops, either. St. John was a rugged harbor city with its fair share of crime. Although, much of it was petty crime that comes along with being an important port city. Transient sailors and local drunks made up the majority of the shady characters that often ended up in the police cells. This kind of obviously premeditated mass-attempted murder was something else entirely, though. The police weren't altogether sure where to even begin, because there were so few clues. The white boxes were all the same. They were three or four inches square, with nothing on them but six postage stamps each, and the handwritten address. The handwriting was especially interesting to them, because it seemed to be their only clue. It was strange handwriting, though. It was unusually mechanical. It was symmetrical. The Daily Telegraph described it. The handwriting as seen upon the fatal package is almost like copper plate in its regularity, and there are some who think they see in it evidence that a woman's guilty hand held the pen which, in cool malignity, shaped the letters that sent the grim message forth. A method of assassination as deadly as it is simple. This was a strange and bewildering case. Most oddly, however, it closely resembled another case that had happened nearly a year earlier, several provinces away. On October 4th, 1888, a series of unsolved poisonings had rocked Ontario and it had made headlines all over the country. The candies had been mailed to the houses of religious leaders in small, white, boxes. The police officer who investigated the similar series of poisonings one year earlier in Ontario was none other than John Wilson 
Murray. You may not recognize that name, but maybe you recognize the name Inspector Alistair Cameron, the lead character from the early 1980s CBC TV show The Great Detective. No? Well, in that case, you might recognize the name Detective William Murdoch, the lead character of the CBC's international smash hit TV show Murdoch Mysteries. Both of these television characters are based on the real-life detective from Ontario, John Wilson Murray, who investigated those Ontario candy poisonings. John Wilson Murray published a, shall we say, highly dramatized version of his detective career in 1904, which he oh so humbly named, The Memoirs of a Great Detective. In his book, John Wilson Murray breaks down Case by case, the stories from his long and famous detective career were counting them in a very dramatic fashion. John Wilson Murray actually investigated the series of candy poisonings in Galt, Ontario, and he included a chapter on his investigation of the case in his famous book. He called it The Case of the Hollowed Chocolate. Great excitement prevailed in the county of Waterloo. Many people were terrified. Others infuriated. A fiend was among them, spreading death and planning the extermination of whole families. No one had any clue to the mysterious one's identity. It might be a stranger. It might be a neighbor. It might be a person of high estate. Or it might be a creature of low degree. None knew, and there were a myriad of suspicions. The climax came when little Meta D. Cherry, the three-year-old daughter of John Cherry, a prominent mill owner of Galt, died in a sudden and mysterious way. I went to Galt, a prosperous town near Berlin, in the county of Waterloo. It was September 1888. Several persons were sick, as if a plague were upon them. I looked at the little child. She seemed startled, even in death, as if the hand that thrust her into eternity had seized her roughly and scared her. I talked with John Cherry, and he told me of a box of chocolate drops that had come through the mail. He showed me the box. A few of the chocolates were gone. Little Meta had eaten them. I took one out and carefully scraped the chocolate off with a knife blade. I found in the bottom of the chocolate a spot where a cavity had been bored, and this had been filled with a whitish substance, unlike the creamy candy of the chocolate, and the hole then had been sealed deftly by glazing over the bottom with more chocolate. I took the contents of the box and sent the chocolates to Professor Ellis for analysis. I examined the box minutely. It revealed no clue, simply an ordinary pasteboard box. The package had been mailed in Galt. On inquiry, I learned that similar packages had been received by the Reverend John Ridley, minister of the Church of England in Galt, and by Miss May Lowell and Mrs. Lowell, daughter and wife of Charles Lowell, proprietor of the Queen's Hotel in Galt. The boxes were quite small, and the inscriptions were alike as to the soft lead pencil. Professor Ellis reported that the cavities in the chocolate drops were filled with strychnine. I spent days gathering all the gossip of the town for generations back, hearing all the tales of trouble, and searching for some secret feud or deadly hatred that would supply a motive for the deed. I ransacked ancestral closets for family skeletons and I poked in all the after-dark affairs and twilight scandals since the days when the oldest inhabitants were gay young folk, fond of walking hand in hand through the gloaming. I ran down secrets that distressed dear old ladies and left them in tears. I heard confessions of heirs of youth that had lain locked in gentle bosoms for many kindly years. In fact, for a time, I was an old Paul Pry gadabout, poking my nose into other folk's business until I felt I had sifted the lives and winnowed the chaff from the wheat in the collective career of the entire community. Every town has its chamber of horrors, where the sad episodes of indiscreet living are laid away to crumble in darkness, and the town of Galt has no more than its share of secrets of the passing generations. I found nothing in the long gone years to throw light on the crime. I did develop promptly a strong suspicion as to the person who did send the poison packages, but I found no clue that would hold in a trial as sufficient evidence to convict anybody. It is one of the most aggravating cases of my entire experience. Even John Wilson Murray, Detective Murdoch from Murdoch Mysteries himself, 
was not able to figure out the case of the poison candy. The killer had disappeared from Ontario without a trace. And now, one year later, the candy killer was back and poisoning again, this time in St. John. Four days after the boxes of candy were sent around St. John, on a Saturday afternoon at 6.30 p.m., two police officers walked into Barker's department store, one of the biggest and most prestigious shops in all of St. John, right on the main boulevard of King Street. It was a remarkable store for the time, and it was the height of stylish shopping for wealthy, more upscale St. Johners to shop at. It had, until recently, been owned by George Barker, who had recently been elected mayor, but had tragically died soon after, under rather mysterious circumstances. Barker's department store sold everything from groceries to high-end clothes. It had a butcher shop, it had a stationery shop, it had a jewelry counter, and it even had a pharmacy. The two detectives were uncomfortable, They did not fit inside the high-end shop. And they were not altogether confident about why they were even sent there in the first place. Their investigation into the candy poisoner had only just begun. They certainly didn't have any suspects in mind. However, three hours earlier, the province's solicitor general had phoned their police station. Solicitor General Pugsley had explained that because of a mysterious anonymous woman's tip, he was ordering the police to arrest a quiet and shy 24-year-old stenographer who worked in the offices at Barker's department store named William McDonald. Inside of the department store, the two detectives approached the young man. He looked at them, and without even so much as a hello turned to one officer in particular, named Detective Ring, and asked, Are you here to take me to the lunatic asylum? When the perplexed detective asked him why ever would he assume that he was going to take him to the lunatic asylum, William MacDonald explained, Why Detective Ring? Because you took me there last time. Detective Ring had not immediately recognized the young man. After pausing for a moment to think, he remembered a strange incident that had happened the previous spring. The detective had been on the Market Slip, which is a pier along St. John's Waterfront, just down the hill from the department store that they were currently standing inside of. The detective had been standing on the pier, casually chatting about his summer plans with a friend, when he saw a young man purposefully walk down the slip to the end of the dock, Without so much as even flinching, he stepped off the pier into the waters of St. John Harbor. The young man immediately began to flail around in the water, shouting that he couldn't swim. Detective Ring, along with several other ordinary St. Johners who were nearby, didn't think twice, and they jumped into the water to save the young man. When they dragged him back to the shore, the young man looked at them in all seriousness and told them, I am the prophet Elijah, and God has commanded me to make myself known to you in this way. Detective Ring was perplexed by this obviously troubled young man, and took him to the St. John Lunatic Asylum for his own protection, and for him to get better. William MacDonald had spent three months in the asylum, and he had been pronounced by the doctors to be cured of whatever strange malady he had struggled with, and he was discharged. After being released, he had gotten a job at Barker's department store. Inside of Barker's department store, in the hopes of not causing a scene in the posh shop filled with its wealthy patrons, Detective Ring quietly whispered to William MacDonald that he was under arrest on suspicion of having sent the poison candy. William MacDonald appeared shocked and he cried out, Good gracious, they don't blame me for that. More bewilderingly for Detective Ring, though, he didn't know why he had arrested the young man, either. Only about half an hour after arresting William MacDonald, the St. John police called a press conference. This would actually be the police's first statement about the murder. It was actually even the first time they officially acknowledged publicly that the poisonings had even happened. 
at the press conference, the police announced that William McDonald had been arrested for the series of boxes of poisoned candy, which had been sent to several people in the city four days earlier. The police then declared that they were pleased to announce that William McDonald was insane. The assembled audience cheered. The Daily Telegraph newspaper explained this curious reaction. We all breathed a sigh of relief when it was announced that the young man had been insane. Everyone was pleased to think that St. John did not contain a man in his proper senses who could be guilty of such a terrible crime. At the press conference, the police mentioned that the arrest had been ordered by Solicitor General Pugsley after a mysterious woman informant had come forward with information that led to William McDonald's arrest only hours after she spoke to the Solicitor General. The press seized on this mysterious woman, and newspapers began to speculate wildly on who the secret informer could be, and what her relationship with the accused was, and why she came forward. For example, the Moncton Times wrote, Almost universal credence seems to be given to the report that a young woman knew or thought she knew enough to justify a belief in his guilt and made this known to Solicitor General Pugsley. One story is that one of the girls in Barker's department store where he worked saw him put candy in a box. Another is that a girl where he boarded was the informer. But the fact is, no one knew who she was. Solicitor General Pugsley and the police remained tight-lipped about the mysterious woman's identity, simply saying that she had given them enough evidence to justify his arrest. Back inside the police station, William McDonald seemed to be in high spirits as the police searched him. On his person, they found a loaded revolver, several loose cartridges, the key to his house, a key to Barker's department store where he worked, and a notebook. William McDonald asked for a pencil and paper, which the police provided him. He began writing down all the things the police had found on him while searching him. He remarked, A person always wants to have a memorandum of everything to know just where they go to. I've lost a lot of things before by not keeping a record. Detective Ring replied, That may be so, but surely not in a police station. William McDonald paused and stared at the detective for a moment, and then he laughed. The St. John newspaper reported the impact his arrest had on his family. McDonald's arrest was a terrible blow to his sister, Fanny Barker. Within a comparatively short time, she has lost her bright five-year-old boy, her mother, her father, her husband, and now her brother is under arrest on this fearful charge. A most painful moment occurred in the police station when she was talking with the chief of police. Overcome by her sorrows, she turned from them and, looking upwards, cried out in agony. Oh God, how much more? The chief of police was unable to maintain his composure in the presence of a grief so sacred, so supreme, and so despairing. The sister remains with the prisoner at all times in his cells in the police station. The whole city waits with feverish anxiety for the next act in this terrible drama. The Daily Times newspaper published what they knew of William McDonald in the next day's newspaper. McDonald is a young man, well-educated, son of Jacob McDonald who died recently in Montreal and brother to Fanny Barker, wife of the late mayor George Barker. McDonald worked in Barker's department store for several years. Then he went to Montreal. There he was for a time private secretary to Mr. Shaughnessy of CPR, getting a large salary. He was single and didn't appear to have ever been in a romantic relationship. He was quiet and he kept to himself. He didn't seem to have any friends or interests or hobbies. And it didn't seem that many people who would have seen him almost every day like his landlady and his co-workers at Barker's department store, even remembered who he was. The Mr. Shaughnessy the paper was referring to, William McDonald's old boss, was none other than Baron Thomas Shaughnessy, who would soon become president of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and at this point was its general manager. 
At this time, the Canadian Pacific Railway, which stretched from coast to coast, was failing rather badly and was at risk of bankruptcy. They had hired the self-made Shaughnessy to save them from almost certain bankruptcy. He was brought in to Montreal from the United States, where by the age of 30 he had risen from the lowly position of clerk to president of the Milwaukee Railway. Shaughnessy was famously difficult to work for. His own biographer described him as having an essentially pessimistic view of human nature. And he held a rather obsessive view that anyone and everyone was out to cheat him and must be carefully watched. William MacDonald had been Shaughnessy's private secretary. It was a demanding job working for an extremely demanding man. Although that job was headquartered in Montreal, as the company's private secretary, MacDonald had traveled with his boss all over much of Canada, maintaining a grueling schedule. The big secret that everyone was trying to hide when MacDonald was Shaughnessy's private secretary was that the CPR, Canada's biggest and most important railway, was actually already completely bankrupt. Shaughnessy was in the midst of making drastic reforms to fix the railway, but he needed time for those reforms to start making money. In the meantime, he was keeping the ailing company alive by withholding payments to contractors and to employees, shifting the little money they had left from account to account to cover minimum expenses to keep the struggling company afloat. All of which was of distinctly dubious legality. Shaughnessy was ultimately successful in turning around the CPR, but the toll on those who worked for the company must have been punishing, and especially so for the famously hard-to-work-for man's private secretary, William MacDonald. Perhaps this is why, while working for Shaughnessy, in the words of the Daily Times, MacDonald's health failed and he became slightly deranged. A little less than a year ago, he returned to St. John and stayed with his sister, Fanny Barker. But his mind trouble only increased. His madness seems to have taken the form of religious mania, first in favor of religion, then in favor of atheism. He walked over the end of a wharf under the apparent impression that he could walk on water, and he was sent to the asylum. Newspaper reports were perhaps surprisingly reluctant to jump to conclusions on William MacDonald's guilt. The newspapers were actually remarkably understanding and quite compassionate towards William MacDonald's prior stay in the lunatic asylum, especially for that time. St. John was at the time home to what was considered the most modern and the best asylum in all of Canada, which was surprisingly progressive for the time. More about that can be heard on the Backyard History podcast episode called Secret Diary from the Lunatic Asylum. Of course, it had its problems. It was an asylum in the 1800s, after all, and mental health treatment was not terribly well understood. But, the short version of its complicated story is that St. Johners were very proud of their asylum. It was a massive institution employing hundreds of local people, and it was highly regarded across the country, with wealthy patients traveling from all over Canada to stay in the asylum for what was perceived as the best care available. So it genuinely meant something to St. Johners when the public heard its head doctor come out to the media stating that while William MacDonald had indeed spent three months there, he had gotten better. And he was released because he had been cured. Reporters were very much concerned, and perhaps a little disturbed, to learn that some mysterious anonymous tip from a strange and enigmatic woman could lead to someone's arrest. They demanded to know what evidence the Solicitor General and the police had to back up William MacDonald's alleged guilt. The police were also unaware of any evidence, and they were actually quite upfront with the press that they too didn't know why they had arrested William MacDonald. For example, the chief of police himself told the media, In fact, I have no information to give. All I can say is that the Solicitor General had received such information that warranted McDonald's arrest. Solicitor General Pugsley, however, remained tight-lipped on what evidence he'd received that caused him to order the arrest of William McDonald. Frustrated reporters began their own investigation, rushing around the city trying to piece together clues. A Moncton reporter cornered the coroner and interrogated him for a full hour 
but got no useful information. A reporter for the Daily Telegraph went to Barker's department store to interrogate any woman that worked there in the hope that she was the mysterious informant. The reporter decided that the informant was surely one of the four women who worked in the store's pharmacy. But his investigation only seemed to indicate William McDonald's innocence. It appears that the prisoner never visited this portion of the warehouse. The girls are also unacquainted with his handwriting. They seldom saw him and never on any of his rare visits had he ever manifested any unusual appearance or behaved in a strange or excited way. The reporter also learned that the suspect appeared to have nothing to do with the drugs in the pharmacy, which did, however, include stocks of strychnine. Most importantly, though, that reporter discovered that in Barker's department store's pharmacy, one bottle of strychnine was missing. Who was the prisoner? Most persons have been puzzled to imagine any theory in which even an insane person could have made a selection of the four clergymen whose lives were attempted. The answers to these questions would arrive soon enough, though, in William MacDonald's series of pre-trial inquests held on the 15th, 19th, and 22nd of October, and the later trial which concluded on December 23rd of that same year. Unfortunately, I encountered a rather bizarre issue in my research at this point. The actual transcripts of the inquest and the trial itself have disappeared. There wasn't actually anything suspicious about the disappearance of those files, though. It wasn't like there was a grand conspiracy to cover up the trial of the candy killer. The reality is so much... dumber. You see, nowadays, any important documents like that would be stored at the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick. However, in the greater scheme of history, the Provincial Archives are basically brand new. They were only first established in the 1960s. Before the Archives were formed, important old documents were just stuffed wherever. Sometimes they were even kept in random people's attics. A lot of them were kept in the legislature, though, where they were stuck in random corners, or put up in the ceiling, or basically just stuck wherever there was space. And when tourists would visit, they would take home some important priceless historic documents as a souvenir from their time visiting the province. All of the documents from the Candy Killer trial were believed to have been stuffed in a cubbyhole in the legislature, and it's believed that some tourist walked off with the only copy of the documents from the trial. We can't actually even blame the tourists though, really, because the legislature tour guides would often actually encourage tourists to take a handful of documents as souvenirs. Since we lack actual trial documents, I had to piece together the events of the trial from the often very detailed descriptions in newspaper reports covering the trial. It's less than ideal, but it is adequate for piecing together what happened, because often each newspaper wrote extraordinarily in-depth, multi-page long articles on each day of the inquest and trial. During the inquest and the trial, the newspapers took pains to emphasize that both the prosecution and the defense conducted themselves, by all accounts, admirably. William MacDonald's defense lawyer, Charles Weldon, diligently cross-examined every witness and tried their best to poke holes in the prosecution's case against their client. Meanwhile, the prosecution, led by Solicitor General Pugsley, was widely praised for sticking close to the facts of the case, rather than relying on emotion and drama. At the end of the trial, both men praised each other, which was by no means common in the cutthroat legal world of the time. In short, the problem the prosecution faced was that there was no direct evidence linking William MacDonald to the crimes. Furthermore, the mysterious woman informant who turned him in would not be taking the stand or otherwise giving any evidence. That meant that it fell to Solicitor General Pugsley to build a case of enough circumstantial evidence linking William MacDonald to the poisonings that the jury would find him guilty. Meanwhile, MacDonald's defense lawyer, Charles Weldon, had to poke holes in these arguments to raise enough doubts in the jury's mind that they would find him 
not guilty. Solicitor General Pugsley's first goal was to point out that the candy poisoner's victims were all linked, and that they were indeed linked to William MacDonald. He managed to show that there were links. It is now stated that three of the ministers named Mr. McRae, Dinestat, and Shaw preached at the asylum, and the fourth, Reverend de Sawyers, officiated at the funeral of the late Mayor Barker, at which the prisoner was present. Then there was the issue of the poison. A bottle of strychnine was missing from Barker's department store. However, employees were unanimous that William MacDonald did not have access to the pharmacy and had never been into the pharmacy, and didn't even seem to have any interest in the pharmacy. However, a clerk at Barker's department store named William Hines testified that one week before the poisonings, William MacDonald had needed to work late to compile some documents. William Hines had left his key so that William MacDonald could lock up when he was done. Solicitor General Pugsley argued that MacDonald could have taken the strychnine during that time. But then the defense lawyer, Charles Weldon, managed to poke holes in that argument. He found a witness from another department named Horatio Enslow, who had also worked late that night, and he testified that William MacDonald had not left his desk during that time. Also, the defense pointed out that the key was left alone on the retail desk waiting for MacDonald to pick it up for several hours, meaning that someone other than his client could have taken it. Next, Solicitor General Pugsley brought in a young man named Lewis Connolly to testify. Connolly worked at a shop that made keys and testified that William MacDonald had come in about a half a week before the poisonings and had a brass key made. When the keymaker and William MacDonald were chatting, the accused had told him that he had bought a gun a week and a half earlier and would be going away after dropping the key off to do some target practice. On cross-examination by the defense, however, it turned out that Connolly couldn't remember what the key looked like or the exact dates when William MacDonald dropped off the key and when he picked it up although he did acknowledge there was a several-day gap when William MacDonald had left the key at the shop. Considering the timeline was moving close to when the poison candies were sent, the murkiness with the timeline was very important. Solicitor General Pugsley then produced the key that William MacDonald had on him when he was arrested. Lewis Connolly recognized the key as being some of his work. Next, Solicitor General Pugsley called Dr. James T. Steves, who had been in charge of the St. John Lunatic Asylum since 1876, to the stand to testify about William MacDonald's stay in that institution one year earlier. The elderly Dr. Steves was highly respected in St. John and was considered to be on the forefront of a more kindly and humanitarian way of caring for patients who were struggling with mental health. He was particularly known for his aversion to keeping patients tranquilized all of the time, which was, at the time, standard policy in other asylums. He said, Narcotics may be the instruments of doing harm. And proudly boasted that under his innovative and controversial approach of actually talking to patients about their problems and encouraging exercise rather than staying in bed, his asylum had achieved the lowest suicide rate in all of North America. William MacDonald was a patient in the asylum. He was admitted on October 29, 1888. The patient suffered from monomania, an exaggerated or obsessive enthusiasm for or preoccupation with one thing. His symptoms weren't very pronounced, but they were sufficient to judge by. He was peculiar in his manner, reticent, stealthy, excitable, and sometimes depressed. He was different from most young men of his age. In some matters he was very clear, and in others he was insane. MacDonald was utterly irreligious and profane. A peculiar feature of some insane persons is to manifest a wide difference from the life they formerly lived. It is understood that before he was admitted to the asylum that he was a very religious man. It is not an uncommon occurrence for such a person to become very profane. 
William MacDonald had explained to Dr. Steves that when he walked off the end of the pier, he thought that he was the prophet Elijah. He thought that the ground at the bottom of the St. John Harbor would rise up to the surface to prevent him from drowning. While he claimed to be cured of the impression that he was the prophet Elijah, Dr. Steves was suspicious. Once, when another inmate at the lunatic asylum claimed to be a prophet, William MacDonald punched him in the face. MacDonald was finally discharged on July 4th, 1889. To an ordinary observer, MacDonald was entirely cured when discharged. Did you think the patient was cured when he was discharged, Dr. Steves? The large amount of patients when discharged remain cured. But did you think the patient was cured when he was discharged, Dr. Steves? I was not assured to the permanency of his recovery. My reason for not being satisfied with McDonald's recovery was that he did not appear to be thankful. A great deal of the trial revolved around handwriting analysis. The prosecution had hired, at great expense, a handwriting expert to come up from Boston to testify. While much time and arguing was spent going over whether the handwriting on the address matched William McDonald's writing, it didn't really seem to go anywhere. The short version of what was actually a fairly long story was that the Solicitor General Pugsley had the expert testifying at length, letter by letter, about the handwriting. While the expert found some similarities, it wasn't conclusive. And then, the defense lawyer, Charles Weldon, produced a whole notebook of William MacDonald's. It turned out that William MacDonald had something of an unusual hobby of writing in different styles. The notebook contained copied song lyrics and poems and notes, each written in a completely different handwriting style. His co-workers also testified that he frequently wrote in different styles. He changed from writing forwards to writing backwards, from writing left-handed to writing right-handed. As it turned out, though, this may not have been particularly nefarious. He was a writing tutor to many different people in the city. In fact, he was giving a lesson the night the poison candies were mailed, which offered a potential alibi. As for William MacDonald himself, he was never allowed to testify. He was present for the trial, but he didn't participate at all. According to the Daily Telegraph, The prisoner appears to be enjoying excellent health. He watched yesterday's proceedings very closely and several times made short hand notes of the evidence. He indulged considerable conversations with his counsel. The witness seemed most interested in the testimony and he took copious notes. The other really bizarre thing about the trial was that it was simply accepted that there was no motive. It was referred to several times that it was a strange case as no one had any reason to poison the religious leaders. Curiously, though, nobody asked. William MacDonald was right there, and he seemed to be quite chatty, at least towards his lawyer, but he was never called to testify and was never once asked about any relationships with the victims. Finally, the court heard about the activities of William MacDonald the night before the poison candy arrived. This is the critical window in which the little white boxes were mailed. I only found one surviving source in the Daily Telegraph covering this part of the trial, and it's a big old block of text. I'm not sure whether it's supposed to be a conversation or whether the reporter simply chose an unusual writing style, but we'll simply give it to you as it appeared, and you can make up your own mind. Then there was the Tuesday evening before the packages were sent out. What were the facts concerning the actions of the prisoner that evening? Why he came into the store around 7.30 in the evening, went into the office and saw Willie Hines. He then went outside, came back to the office and, as Willie Hines said, grabbed a pen. He then went out to the drug table and was engaged in writing for some minutes. Writing how? Willie Hines says he thought it was a piece of white blotting paper. But the suspicious circumstances was that the prisoner kept his arm around the package, presumably to guard it from observation. He was also seen there by Wasson as late as 8 o'clock, shortly after he went out. 
This, it has been said, showed that he could not have gone to the post office and mailed the packages in time to reach Indian Town and give his shorthand lesson to Mr. Vernon McClellan. It was a matter of fact, however, that the prisoner could have left the store, taken a horse car, and reached Mr. McClellan's in time to give the lesson. After that, it would be time for the jury to decide William McDonald's fate. The judge stood to explain to the jury the laws on insanity. After his explanation, the judge said, Another question for the jury's consideration was, did it appear that the prisoner, if guilty, committed the crime when unable to distinguish between right and wrong? It has been proved that at one time the prisoner had been insane, and I would leave the question to be decided by the jury if they found the prisoner guilty, whether they would also find that he knew what he was doing when he committed the crime. The absence of a motive might warrant the jury in coming to a conclusion that at the time he committed this crime, if they found that he did commit it, the prisoner's mind was so worked and astray in regard to moral distinctions that he did not know what he was doing, or that he had really committed a crime. The jury retired to their rooms and all the testimony papers, etc. in the case were sent to them. His honor remained in court until 5 o'clock for the jury, but at that hour announced that he would return at 8 o'clock if not sent for before. At 9.25 p.m., the courthouse doors opened. The jury had come to a verdict. Duly, the room filled up with reporters and curious onlookers. The jury was already seated. William MacDonald was led in by police officers. One newspaper noted that he skipped in with a jaunty step. The judge stood up and asked the jury if they'd agreed on a verdict. The foreman replied, we have, and handed over a piece of folded paper. The assembled audience rose to their feet expectantly. The judge, however, didn't read the verdict aloud. Instead, he silently read it to himself. The judge turned to the jury and he asked them out loud, in front of everyone, in an incredulous tone of voice. Do you really feel the defendant was guilty? The punishment for being found guilty of murder at the time was death. The Daily Telegraph wrote, the prisoner himself at this point cast an anxious, surprised look at the judge and showed considerable nervousness by shifting his position in the docket two or three times, fingering his shirt collar and cuffs, and otherwise displaying surprise at this proceeding on the part of the jury. The judge then addressed the jury. Gentlemen, do I understand you to say that you are of the opinion that the prisoner is guilty but that he was insane at the time he committed the crime with which he stands charged? The jury foreman said yes. Then your verdict should be that you acquit the prisoner of the charge, whereof he stands indicted on account of insanity, for in the eyes of the law, an insane person cannot commit a felony. In an astonishing move, the jury was sent back by the judge to their chambers to change their verdict. The jury returned some half an hour later. This time, they declared William MacDonald guilty, but was specifically acquitted because he was insane at the time of the crime. Solicitor General Pugsley then rose to order that William MacDonald be remanded into custody at the St. John Lunatic Asylum. As the prisoner was led away, he was heard quietly saying, but I have not been allowed to say anything. William MacDonald was taken to the St. John Lunatic Asylum, a large, dark, and ominous grey building on the far side of the city. He would spend the rest of his life there, until he died in 1926, after 36 years in that asylum. By then, he was seemingly forgotten by everyone, Everyone, that is, except his sister. Fanny Barker would make the trip to the asylum several days a week to visit her brother for decades. She wrote prolifically to the asylum superintendent, detailing how her brother was faring in the asylum. These remarkable letters, some of which still survive, reveal several startling plot twists in the saga 
of the candy killer. According to his sister, William MacDonald was happy in the lunatic asylum. Rather curiously, despite being a convicted murderer, William MacDonald was not locked up in the dreaded and infamously cruel Ward 5 of the asylum, where the criminally insane were kept. It seemed that his sister, Fanny, and the Solicitor General Pugsley had managed to get him placed in the general population of the asylum instead. While this was hardly a luxury hotel, it was vastly better than the terrifying Ward 5 for the criminally insane. Interestingly enough, it seems that William MacDonald was allowed to have special privileges and some small luxuries in the asylum as well. Though these series of letters by Fanny to the asylum superintendent span several decades, and they don't come out explicitly and say this, they do imply, heavily, very heavily imply, that the mysterious woman informant that nobody ever identified, the one who turned in William MacDonald before he could kill again, was his own sister, Fanny Barker. At one point, ten years after the poisoning, a new commissioner was placed in charge of the asylum and placed William MacDonald in Ward 5 for the criminally insane. Fanny wrote a letter angrily demanding that he be returned to the general population, seemingly implying that this was in violation of some kind of deal. It seems to imply that the sister possibly had set up a deal with Solicitor General Pugsley, which would stop her brother from killing again, but also not condemn her brother, who was her last living relative, to execution as a convicted murderer. Nor would this deal condemn him to a fate worse than death, ending up in the lunatic asylum's dreaded Ward 5 for the criminally insane. After Fanny Barker's series of letters, William MacDonald was placed back in the general population of the asylum. Her letters to the asylum superintendent were almost always professional, discussing her brother's health and comfort. However, ten years after the murders, one of Fanny Barker's letters seems to dreamily drift off, as if she were thinking aloud. She wrote, It was said he went out of his mind. He was a brother-in-law of my late husband, George Barker, the mayor of St. John at that time. If you remember, George died very suddenly, and it was said that William was not wholly guiltless in the matter. But my brother was a friend of ours. If there is anything you can do to help him, you would. And if you can help him, I would take it as a personal favor. Believe me. Sincerely yours, Fanny Barker. The Chemist, W.F. Best, voiced by Jordan Batstone. Fanny Barker, voiced by Stephanie Tate. William McDonald, voiced by Kaylin Fraser. Dr. James Christie and Dr. James T. Steves, voiced by Josh Green. The Dying Catherine McRae, voiced by Stephanie Tate. Solicitor General Pugsley, voiced by Jordan Batstone. That was Backyard History, with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.